want you to see the title on the screen. How does that title sit with you? That word, unhurried. Does it describe you? Or you're going, yeah, right. As a friend of mine describes sometimes the things in the spiritual life that God offers us, it's kind of like the brochure to Hawaii. It looks great, it's beautiful, and it's inspiring. But we're never going to go there. And I think a word like this kind of fits that. Man, we want it, we long for it because our life is so hurried, so rushed, so frantic, so stressful, so busy, I mean just busy, that an unhurried life is kind of like that brochure to Hawaii. Sounds great. I'm never going to get there because I've tried over over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. But yet, not only am I unhurried or less hurried, I'm more hurried than I ever was before. I, I, you've, some of you may have heard this before, and, and it is true. Every message is for me that I preach. This one, y'all are just coming along on my journey because for this topic, I preach it from a place of longing and from a place of absolute failure. If you could see what my constant hurried look like, life look like, you would realize I have no clue what I'm talking about today. But yet God placed this topic in front of me. And I want to thank first my daughter Danielle that introduced me to it. As she's a witness to my life. And she recommended a, a book by an amazing teacher named John Mark Comer. And he wrote a book. In fact, if you look on your handout, it's one of the resources I urge you to get uh, as additional resources because there's no way we can cover this topic in big depth today. And he goes in depth in it. And it's an amazing book. Uh, but she had told me about it. Um, and so I was like, yeah, I'm going to get to it one day. And my hurried life never did. And this week, as so it's interesting, last week we talked about being happy that the Lord smacked me upside my head at a two-day retreat where this week it was a, another one right across the face going, wake up. And I mean, my week was insane. Insane. I mean, barely got to get to this message. And that has kind of become a norm. And the Lord said, you have a problem and we need to deal with it. And normally what I'd love to do is kind of Absorb the topic, study it, apply it, and then bring it to you from a place of experience. The Lord said, no, so many others need to hear this message because you're not the only one. And pretty much everybody in this audit, this congregation, I need to speak to today as their loving father. But we got to get some things corrected. And so we're going to see this is a universal issue that has major consequences. We're, we're in a season or, or a year that God has given us a vision word of advance, of moving forward. And what he's doing is, is showing us what to move forward to. He's, he's given us not just this vision word of advance, but these words that we find in Scripture, these topics that he said, I want you to see where to point your life toward, that we're not just kind of roaming around moving, thinking we're productive. He said, unless you're moving forward with your next right step, you're going to miss what I have for you. And so we've been learning these topics, and today's the fifth one of being unhurried. Now, if you've been around long enough, you've heard me preach on things like rest and Sabbath. And those are so crucial and so important. And being still. But that's not what this is. Those things could be a piece of this. But this message goes way further than those things. We're not talking about an occasional nap or a day off. It's, but it's a mindset and lifestyle change that is radically countercultural. I want to go back in history a little bit. You know, as history's gone on, there's always been inventions and innovations that have tried to help us do things easier, whether it's 
farming, whether it's building something uh, in our homes, just all throughout history, innovation that God has opened the door. And we've been on a crazy rapid pace the last 300 years that is exponentially increasing in speed of technology over the last 100 years and then even moving into the last 30 years. And what was interesting, there was, there was a, a Senate subcommittee in 1967 that just kind of studied innovation as technology was ramping up. It was the space age coming out of two world wars. I mean, just so much was advancing. Computers were coming online. And they looked at it and said, I want you to catch this, by 1985, that the average American would only work 22 hours a week and only work 27 weeks of the year. In fact, they said the problem was we would have too much leisure. And like the government always does, they missed it bad. <laughs> <laughs> they went the wrong way. And so that and climate change, they just missed it, okay? And I'm sorry, throw, throw my little nugget in there. Sorry about that. But here's what's ironic. All these time-saving devices just made it easier to fill our day with more stuff. So it was meant to save us time, took away time. And I want, you to, I want you to catch this thought so we clarify. Being hurried isn't a productive life, that we're being productive on things that mattered, and we just have a full life. That's not what being hurried is. Jesus had a full life, but Jesus was never hurried. What hurried is, is having too much to do so we're always hurrying to try to keep up or catch up. Big difference. And we live in this fast-paced society, and we live with marketing constantly in front of us that there's more. And, and I'll say they, they give us these fake ideals. We talked about that last week with happiness. This fake image in front of us that we'll just do these things or have this stuff or go to these places. We'll be happy. And, and so what happens is all these fake ideals cause us that we just want more and we feel like we're falling behind because we don't have what the picture in front of us shows us. We, we don't have what the TikTok says we need to have. And we have all these, these influencers, social media and YouTube, that says this is the better life, and they portray it. And, and with all the right camera angles and all the right makeup and all the right backgrounds, and we think that's what I don't have, and so I need to catch up to that. And we're hurried and hurried in our mind, in our calendar, this fast-paced society, and we're falling behind. So we just try to go faster and faster. And what happens is we end up feeling this chronic state of stress and anxiety. And what science has proven over and over, over decades, is that we're, we're in a state of what I'll call hurried panic. There's a stress hormone that releases in our body called cortisol. And what it does is as it increases what happens, multiple things happen. One is we feel, we, ha we do have high blood pressure and we feel anxious. Then it leads us to one or two behavior patterns, which is either overeating or undereating. Both are problematic. And then that leads to health issues in our body, but also psychological issues in our mind. Now, and look, I'm not, I'm not always in line with psychologists on stuff. They, they come up with a name for everything, and some of it's like, really, come on. Now you're just making excuses. They came up with one, and I'm going to put it up a second, that when you see it, you're going to laugh, and you're going to go, yeah, right. And I'm going to get you just to hang with me, because they may have it right on this one. Here's what it's called. Hurry sickness. Now, y'all laugh, maybe you're like, well, I'm sick, because you know it's true. 
One, one Stanford psychologist defines it this way. A behavior pattern of continual rushing and anxiousness, overwhelming and continual sense of urgency. Is anybody sick in the room? A malaise in which a person feels chronically short of time and so tends to perform every task faster. Man, that's Randy Creel. Goodness gracious. And this last sentence is like a bat to my head. They get flustered when encountering any kind of delay. Thank you, Philip Zimbardo. Man, when I look at my life, you know I'm just being real with you guys. I live so frustrated because it's just not going right. And I'm constantly in a hurry. I'm constantly late. Now, I may arrive on time, but thank God there weren't cops between here and there. And it's bad. Like, this is bad. I heard one author describe it as like an endless marathon, but you don't have you don't get water or rest, but yet you're still hoping to catch up with every, with everybody else. <laughs> I'll go back to uh, some of y'all have read the book that that uh, it's not the title, but that about Alice in Wonderland, and some of you've seen the movies, and and the Red Queen is there. The Red Queen says something interesting, which I think is relevant for us today. She said, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. Anybody feel that way? You have to run faster and faster and faster just to get to the same place. This one's really interesting. This was a cardiologist that wrote this, and I'm going to tell you why it's really interesting in this moment. But he wrote this. He said that, talk about hurry sickness, and he's the one that came up with this term. He said it's a continual, continuous struggle, an unremitting attempt to accomplish or achieve more and more things or participate in more and more events in less and less time. What's interesting about this, he was a cardiologist, and he, uh, he's the one that, that realized that type A personalities, the ones that are just, man, they're running. They're, they're kind of the, also the leaders. But that type A, they're the ones that have the biggest anger issues and the biggest heart issues, heart problems. He's a cardiologist, and he wrote books. This statement, he said in the 1950s. This wasn't last decade, this year. 1950s, he wrote this. Now, I wasn't around then. I think we're a lot crazier than it was then. It's not getting better. And innovation isn't helping, it's hurting. And there's a big lie in, that we worry about that if we don't rush, will accomplish less. But research has found there's no relationship, there's no correlation between hurry and productivity. Man, I hate that. <laughs> I really thought I was being more productive. Working faster and faster, harder and harder, just try to get the same things done. I'm just in a hurry. Gandhi said this, there's more to life than increasing its speed. Now, we can look at this physically, mentally, and go, Pastor, what are you talking about? You're talking about all these people. We're in church. But let's talk about Jesus and spiritual things. Great, I'm glad you said that. Because hurry doesn't just hurt us physically and emotionally. It hurts us spiritually. And I want you to remember what the Bible says. The Bible says we're spirit, soul, and body. 
We're holistic beings. You can even add on top of that relationships. And emotions fall in there. Like, just like God is Father, Son, Spirit, we are spirit, soul, or mind, and body. And everything fits together. You know how I know this? Have bad back pain and see how well your time with God goes. Get really sick. How's your marriage? How's your mind? Have financial trouble. What does it do to you? Is your time with God just full of joy? No. Where all these parts are interlinked, guess what? Hurry affects us spiritually. There was a, 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 a researcher, a godly researcher named Michael, Michael Zigarelli. And... Um, he actually did a, a worldwide study of 20,000 people, Christians, to study obstacles to spiritual growth. And he found five things. Here was the results of this study. And I want you to see them on the screen. The first one is, Christians are assimilating to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload. Catch that? Which leads to number two, God becoming more marginalized in Christians' lives. Think hurry doesn't have an effect? Makes God less and less because other things are more and more important because we're trying to do them. Which then leads to number three, a deteriorating relationship with God. Online, you catching this? I mean, you getting this? Which leads to number four, Christians becoming even more vulnerable to adopting secular assumptions about how to live. So now we're drawing away from God, but it's drawing closer to the world. Which leads to, my God, is there more? More conformity to a culture of busyness, hurry, and overload. And the cycle begins again. That's what he found. 20,000 Christians. It affects us spiritually. There was a pastor who wrote a book. His name was A.J. Swoboda. And he wrote this book. And there's another good one. I didn't write it down. But you can look it up. It's called Subversive Sabbath. Whoa, what a title. Subversive Sabbath. And he says this in the book. I was in a meeting with our church's financial board. Sitting there, it dawned on me that if I were to cheat on my wife, I would lose my job. If I stole from the church, I would be run out of town. If I lied about the church's finances, I would be in huge trouble. If I worshipped another god, I'd be removed. There are nine commandments that if I chose to break... I might lose my ministry over. But if I did not keep a Sabbath, I would probably get a raise. He's so productive. He gets so much done. He's such a hard worker. Man, he's always running. I worked somewhere, in fact, that they, they identified you as somebody productive and worthy of promotion and honor by how, how fast you walked. You were getting there. You were doing something. And I'll say there's somewhat truth to that. In fact, we learned we would walk around, have something in your hand, and get moving because it showed you were being productive and not lazy. And it was a church environment. Rush, 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 rush. Rush, rush, rush. Fast, fast, fast. Speed, speed, speed. Some of y'all have heard of Corey Ten Boom. It was, uh, she was made famous by the movie The Hiding Place. World War II with the Holocaust, her and her family had taken hostage, and they, had, they were hiding and part of the underground for rescuing Jews. She said this, if the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. 
So Satan doesn't always show up as temptation for big sin. He doesn't always show up that way. He doesn't show, always show up as big attacks, but sometimes it shows up as a dopamine rush from an addiction to your phone. I'm going to share this statistic later. Do you know the average person touches their phone over 2,600 times a day? The younger generation, by the way, y'all and young adults, y'all touch it double than that. Double of that. Over 5,000. But he shows this rush from addiction to your phone or an extra hour at the office. One commitment on top of many commitments. Another meeting at life's frantic speed. Maybe that's how the devil shows up. The, the, the famous uh, psychologist Carl Jung yeah, that came up with uh, what's called the, the, Mig, the Briar, Meyer Briggs personality test, brilliant man, said this, busyness is not of the devil, busyness is the devil. This is from a, somebody that studied people. That was his job, studying people. You don't believe me? In, in, in the Bible, it uses certain people as pictures. One of the pictures of the enemy was the Pharaoh in, with the Israelites that Moses came to deliver. And here, here they were, guess what happened? When, when Moses shows up to say, Set, let my people go, what does Pharaoh do in response? Y'all remember? He increased the load. They had to do more work, double the work, double the productivity, and they had to go gather their own supplies. Previously, the supplies were being provided for them. What did they have to do? Hurry it up. They had to speed up. What does the devil do? What's well, to speed things up? And look at what the Pharaoh said about this. He said, make the people work harder. Make the work harder for these people so that they will be too busy to listen to lies. What was the lie? God speaking. What he called a lie was God saying, I want you free from bondage. I want you free to worship me and be with me, and I want to bring you to a better land. The enemy said that's a lie. He said, guess what? They're not going to listen to lies real well if we can just get them busy. We can get them hurried up. You don't think the devil's all involved in iPhones? And social media, are there some good things from it? Sure. But how much bad in the hurry? John Mark Comer says this, when we uncritically hurry, we make the devil's job relatively easy. The great Dallas Willard, who was a professor of philosophy, but mighty man of God, mighty man of God. If you ever get a hold of his material, it's high level, but it's incredible. But he had a man that he was mentoring, another amazing man of God named John Ortberg. And John was at one of the, one of the biggest mega churches uh, out of Chicago, crazy successful church that has influenced churches worldwide for years and he was on staff there and he was just talking to Dallas about just his life and Dallas said this and goes and John asked this question like what do I need to change what do I need to do and Dallas's answer was this hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day you must must ruthlessly eliminate the hurry from your life Wow. And John's Ortberg response was what some of ours may be like, really? Really, hurry? Is it really that big a deal? I mean, of all the big sins, is hurry really the problem? And we may we admit we got a busyness problem, or yeah, we're kind of frantic, but sin, really, are we sure about this? Well, I'll say this, the result is the same. 
sin and hurry has the same result, and it's separation from God. Life is so full what happens, and see if you can relate to this, that our time with God becomes one of two things. Either just another thing on our way too full list of items to do, on our crazy busy agenda, that God's just another one, so we just kind of hurry up and spend our time with God. Get a reading done, or pray, pray efficiently. Maybe we just kind of do it in our car. We didn't have time at home. We were so busy. Or worse, our busyness is that we don't even have time for God. You don't think there's a separation from God issue with hurry? Absolutely there is. Going back to Michael Zigarelli's survey where he found the five problematic things for Christians, the study revealed that 60% of Christians admitted that busyness got in the way of developing their relationship with God. There's a saying you may have heard that, that love and intimacy are spelled T-I-M-E. Jesus often spoke about being one with God, being in union with Him, and knowing Him. But hurry opposes that, doesn't it? Hurry opposes every relationship, by the way. Busyness infects and impairs every relationship, and certainly with God. Look at this in Psalm 46.10, and I want you to see this powerful verse. Look at it. Be still. But I got places to go. Be still. I got so much to do today. Be still. And know that I'm God. <laughs> Knowing God and being unhurried all just go together right there. That word be still is this, this Hebrew word rapa which literally means habitually refuse to be in effort and work. <laughs> to a, and it means the opposite of diligent, focused labor. The, the NASB, in fact, said, it, it translates it, cease striving and know that I'm God. Hurry, 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 work, work, work. And we just kind of put God in there, and we work in our relationship. And he just says, sit down. And sit back in the seat, by the way. Relax. And rest. Then you can know me. That I'm God. John Mark Comer says this. He says, union with God is the heart of the spiritual journey. Sin is missing the mark. What if the mark is union with God? Wow, what a question. Man. Does that just hit you in the gut, by the way? Then sin and being hurried have the same effect. They cut you off from the awareness of and connection to the Spirit of God. There's a, there's a finish proverb that says God did not create hurry. Isaiah 41, 40, 31, you probably know it really well. It says, uh, those who wait upon the Lord will what? Renew their strength. They'll gain new strength, right? Isn't that awesome? How do we get new strength? Wait on the Lord. How hard is that when we're hurried? And how weak do we feel when we're hurried? John Ortberg said this, The great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It's that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a me mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living them. Hurry, then, is not a disordered schedule. Gut punch. 
Hurry is a disordered heart. I did not like that statement when I read it, by the way. Now I got a heart problem. Here's what's interesting. There are three professions known as being the most stressed out. Doctors, lawyers, and can you guess it? Pastors. Mm. Which is so ironic that pastors are stressed out because Jesus said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But pastors are crazy stressed. It's been a horrible few years for pastors. They're quitting at astronomical rates. I don't want to quit. But boy, do I feel it. But Jesus says something different. Frederick Dale Bruner, and I think I left his last name off the, the, the quote here. Sorry about that. But he describes this. He, he was a, a scholar He said, a yoke is a work instrument. Thus, when Jesus offers a yoke, he offers what we might think tired workers need least. (laughs) They need a mattress or a vacation. Can I get an amen? But not a yoke. But Jesus realizes that the most restful gift that he can give the tired is a new way to carry life a fresh way to bear responsibilities. In fact, in Jesus' day, a yoke was not just used for animals for farming, but it was also described when a teacher brought his disciples in, it was his, his teaching about their life and, and what living was supposed to be. That was the yoke. So what Jesus is saying is, make your lifestyle and pace of life be like mine. How I think you think and learn from me. But this, this amazing quote says this, and it, this is John Ortberg also. He says, if you want to follow someone, you can't go faster than the one who is leading. Following Jesus cannot be done at a sprint. Jesus was often busy, but he was never hurried. Being busy is an outer condition. Being hurried is a sickness of the soul. Jesus never went about the busyness of his ministry in a way that severed the life-giving connection between himself and his Father. He never did it in a way that interfered with his ability to give love when that's what was called for. He observed a regular rhythm of withdrawal from activity for solitude and prayer, and he ruthlessly eliminated hurry from his life. You want a great case in point? Jesus was very close to a family. In fact, if, if you read it and it was believed and tradition holds, it's where he went to escape. Some of you all have got some friends that way. You, it's, it's like you go to their house or maybe it's in another town. It's like your way just to get away from the crowds. And Jesus was famous. He was, he was in our day kind of like a pop star. And so everybody followed him and crowded him. This was his place to get away. It was one of his retreats. It was the home of Mary. Martha and Lazarus. Jesus is one day doing his thing out there healing people and setting them free, feeding them. And he gets word, Lazarus is dying. He's right at the point of death. Lazarus was such a good friend that Jesus said, let's hurry up and get there. Let, let, come on, we need, to, we need to, let's stop what I'm doing right now and let me rush over there because my good friend is sick and he needs me. Is that what Jesus did? No, he waited a couple of days. And then when he shows up, Mary and Martha came to him separately with the same response. If you would have just been here, what were they saying? If you would have hurried up, Lazarus wouldn't have died because Lazarus' sickness was so bad he died and they buried him before Jesus got there. 
Even that didn't hurry him. Some of us, man, there's something that happens, and we got to get there now. And Jesus would go, wait, just hold up, swole up. You need to chill with a big pill. Come on, somebody. You need to... Don't get your underwear in a bunch. Radically different thought than, than the way we live. Let, 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 me, let me rephrase that, sorry. Radically different thought than the way I live. So I put the books on the page for you to, to help you. But let me give you three things on how to become unhurried. They are woefully simplistic in terms of how much time I have to talk about them. So I'm going to let you and God get them, but they are so simple, so hard. But the first one is just simplify. There's a trend nowadays called minimalism that uh, often conservatives mock and make fun of. It's kind of hippie-ish. It's a simple lifestyle. Maybe they're on the right track. Because Jesus said things like this. Life does not consist of the abundance of possessions. And often our hurry is because we're pursuing more. He also says this, don't store up wealth and treasure. I wonder if Jesus was a minimalist. I'm going to say this, and here's what here's what's my revelation. Okay, I'll share it with you. Is hurry is a choice to do one or both of two things. But I want you to catch it. Hurry is a choice. Hurry is a choice. To be either one, a choice to have too much to do. Or two, hurry is a choice to try to have too much. Not everything that's available is necessary, though marketing would say it is. And some things aren't sin, but they're worthless. Paul said it this way. He said, you say, I'm allowed to do anything. This is in 1 Corinthians 10, 23. I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. There's a wise uh, philosopher of our day. Her name is Aggie Creel. And she said, just because you can't, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Let me let me let Mama Aggie say it again. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And we fill our lives with hurry and worry. And it's our choice. So we just need to simplify. The second one is organized, and what I'll I'll even add to that single tasking. We brag, man, what we can handle, and I can multitask. Okay. You keep on believing that. Oh, awesome. Good, good for you. In fact, multitasking has become like admirable and bragging, what all we can handle. But what single tasking says, I'm going to focus on the most important thing that's right in front of me. I'm going to, of all the list of things, what's most important, I'm going to focus on on it and put all else aside. Why? So I can do that one thing very well and not just get it done and get it off the list. Single tasking. I look forward to applying that this week and I'll let you know how well it goes. And the third way, and this was going to kind of be like, okay, what are you talking about? I'll explain it. How do you become unhurried? <laughs> You choose the unhurried ways. What? <laughs> what do I mean by that? Okay. 
Now, I'm going to talk to me, and I'm about to give me away. We pick the slow lane of traffic, and we go the speed limit. This next one's going to hurt. I promise you it's going to hurt. At the grocery store, we pick the long line. Some of you, I, you like, you just lost me. Your message stinks. That is heresy. Right? There ain't God. No, God is nowhere in this message. I read that one when they, in the solution. Look, it was solution multiple multiple people that study this stuff they're like you intentionally do that what are you saying i'm choosing to be unhurried by choosing a longer way another one wow this one hits home is to chew your food slowly ask aggie and danielle how how i chew one two three boom one two three boom bite 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 done everybody else is like taking three bites and I'm done and I've already drank three drinks I used to drink so soft drinks so fast that the 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 waiters would be frustrated they would they would bring me a pitcher of the drink because they were tired of refilling my drink so fast not a, not a lie and I was hopped up on caffeine I would drink easily easily a three liter of soft drink at one sitting at a restaurant and I would drive the waiters crazy. And they're like, here, please stop. And I literally had a drinking problem. And it wasn't alcohol. But it affected, to this day, I cannot have caffeine. I overloaded my brain with caffeine so much that I cannot handle it. It destroys my thinking instantly. And I become foggy-headed and cannot think because I drank so fast because I was in a hurry. I wonder what it did to my body eating food like that. Maybe I'll find out as I'm getting older and these things are catching up to me. This is going to take lots, lots of discipline, which is going to be a preview of an upcoming message. Jesus said this to the disciples. They had, they had gone out and healed. So before this verse, Jesus had sent them out two by two to go out in the communities and, and preach the gospel, heal the sick, deliver those who are bound by evil spirits. And they came back hyped up. Man, the demons listen to us. This is awesome. Can you imagine? They were going town to town. And I can imagine there was this excited busyness. Right? Excited hurry, I guess is the best way to say it. They were doing good. And they come back. And Jesus is sitting there waiting for them. Jesus is sitting there waiting for them. And he says this. Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. They had hurried due to the Lord's work. And he says, come away to a secluded place. And rest a while. And look at the behind it. For there were many people coming and going, and they did not have even time to eat. Remember, I told you iPhone touches 2,600 times plus a day. How many were touching our phones? Psalm 16 8 says, I set the Lord continually before me. We touch our phone 2,600 times. I wonder how many times we're setting the Lord continually before us. Or are we setting the Lord continuing before us? Or is it a phone? Is it a to-do list? Is it an appointment? Is it the next thing? The next scroll up? In fact, there's now a thing, and, and I forget what they call it, but, it, but it, 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 it hypes us up, and it's causing us to be feeling we're in control because if we don't like the little TikTok or the Instagram thing we're watching, we just flip to the next one. If it doesn't make us feel good or happy or excited, we just flip to the next one. And we're thinking that's what life is to look like. If it ain't working, I just flip to the next one. And we're hurried, and we're fast-paced. But life doesn't go that way. So we get stressed, and we get anxious, and we get worried. And we're so hurried. And ultimately, it's destroying us spiritually. And our relationship with God gets farther and farther and farther away. John Mark Comer ended, ended chapter 2 
of his book with this question. What is all this pace of life doing to our souls? And I just sat there yesterday. Let me tell you a funny story. So I'm reading this book yesterday. And in our office, it looks out onto our front yard and Highway 42. And across the street, there's these woods. And when the sun rises, it rises through those trees. And so yesterday, I was up at 4 o'clock in the morning, woke up. So I said, I'm going to start spending my time with God. And had just a great, unhurried time with God. And I'm watching the orange of the sun the last few days. It's just Before the sun even gets there, the... The, the glow of the sun moving through the trees. And it was cool outside. And I said, let me just go outside and get some fresh air while the sun's coming up. I'd already been reading for over two hours. And let me just go out there. And so I go and have, we have these chairs out front in our front yard. If you ever drive by, you'll see two brown chairs. And I just go out there and I I'm go to get my blanket. And you know what went to go with me? My phone. <laughs> I'm going outside to enjoy the sunrise and the cool weather and be with God. And what do I look for? And I instantly, I grabbed it and I went, no. And I did something I don't think I've done. I can't remember the last time I did. I left my phone. Y'all, I go to the bathroom and be real transparent in my underwear. And my phone goes with me. Your pastor has a problem. I'm glad you're laughing, but I don't think my family thinks it's very funny, and I don't think God does either. How about you? Would you say that hurry is the greatest threat to your spiritual life? And maybe not. Maybe it's something else, and I'll just remind you this Saturday is free indeed. We want to help with all of it. But I want to encourage you, just bow your head and close your eyes for a second. We're going to come into a time of communion in just a moment. But before we get there, I want you just to think about your life and what you heard today. Does this message ring true? This isn't just an easier life topic. This is about you and God. And while there's principles for a better life and a less stressed life, the issue is separation from God. If you were taking an honest look at your life right now, what would you say?